Oh yeah, welcome to Evil Live, the live media commentary show that answers the question, how many wars in heaven and hell are there? Subscribe if you're new to the channel because today we are reviewing The Prophecy Uprising, number four out of five of the series. I'm almost done here, people. Um, and that's not to say that it's a good thing that I'm almost done because there's a lot to like about this series of films. There's also a lot not to like about it, which is the problem. All right, so my initial thoughts of this is it's... Um, bit of a convoluted story that after having watched it twice, I still am not 100% sure I understand everything, which is not a good sign. But everyone that was involved with the first prophecy or the second prophecy or the third prophecy had nothing to do with this or the next one. So just know that going in, that the fourth and fifth of this series are just the same guy shooting them back to back because he had a story he wanted to tell but he has no connection to anyone else or anything that has uh, come before him. Okay, so this was released June 7th, 2005, written and directed by Joel Soisen. And the logline is, a young theology student comes into the possession of an ancient book of prophecies that stands at the center of a bloody battle on earth between good angels and evil angels. And while that's true... It's not really the focus of like the, the, the film. And I'm going to get into that in just a second here. So there's some actually really nice cast in here. We have uh, Doug Bradley, who played Pinhead, um, old school friend of Clive Barker. He plays uh, Laurel, who is this um, Romanian uh, police officer with a British accent because... <laughs> It's Doug Bradley, and apparently he can't do accents. So they're just like, just do you, man. It's okay. You're Doug Bradley. What do we expect? Um, and that's kind of it. <laughs> John Light, uh, who plays Lucifer in this, also is uh, John Rygert. He's pretty good. He's not a Viggo Mortensen Lucifer, but he does what he was hired to do, and he does it well. Uh, Sean Pertwee plays uh, Danny, and he's this sort of... Um, Oh, geez, I hope I'm, I got the right guy. Anyway, he's like the, the cop of, of the, the show. So basically the premise is set up where it's this dirty cop who gives the money that he gets from roughing up um, the drug dealers and pimps and stuff from Romania and Budapest or, or wherever the hell they are. It's, it was shot in Romania. Um, Bucharest, not Budapest, duh. Uh, anyway, it's, it's like war-torn East Europe. It's really shitty looking. I mean, they chose the worst parts to film in just to sort of heighten this idea of depravity and despair. And it really comes through because it looks like shit. <laughs> so congratulations, I guess. Um, so anyway, we're introduced to this cop and he shakes down this guy. Then he goes to the local church, gives all the money that he stole from the guy to the church and it's just his way of sort of buying it salvation because he's so shamed by what he did as a young kid. So he grew up in the 80s. And in the 80s, Romania, it was going through this communist craze in the film. I don't know about reality. Um, in the film. And they were sort of turning each other in. And so in school, they were teaching you to turn people in to the, the state if they found out you were anti-communist. His parents were. And so he turned in his parents. They were taken to this um, sort of encampment place, um, this uh, sort of mansion that was being run by the local um, interrogator or governor or mayor or something, and they were executed there. And so his sister, and he survived. His sister was taken out of country and put into a, um, a foster home, and he just sort of was raised here, and then he went off to England, and then came back to be a police officer here. And he's trying to pay off the guilt that he suffered from turning his own parents over to the state because he thought he was doing the right thing. He didn't know that they were going to be murdered. And, you know, what are you going to do? But this is a prophecy film, and so th that would be bad enough for any story, right? A guy trying to find redemption. Now we have to throw in the fact that this is angels and demons and war in, on heaven, in heaven and on earth. Um, so it, it leads this idea of this MacGuffin, which is this ancient book that um oh they actually have a name for it too it's called the lexicon and it's basically god's he, he it's his word finishing revelations 
So it's not just talking about, of course, the second war in heaven, which the first three prophecy films were about, but it's also talking about another coming war, um, about how it's going to end. And so the whole shtick is with this MacGuffin is whichever side of the war finds it first, they can use that knowledge to influence the war. And so you got angels, Simon, the angel from the very first prophecy film, not played by the same actor. Uh, this one's played by Jason London, who is um, sort of convincing the young woman, Allison, played by Carrie Wurr, who is the sister from the cop or that I was talking about earlier. She comes back to Bucharest and uh, she's working in that. Uh, they say that she's working as uh, some sort of like religious studies or something like that. I'm looking for my note. And I actually don't see it here. But um, it never says that in the film. It's just her sitting at the op- like the entrance of a church. So you have no real idea what's happening to her. So anyway, she gets her hand on this lexicon, which is just writing itself. And so it's this ancient holy artifact that she is being told by this angel Simon that she needs to keep a hold of it. She's, you know, just sort of gotten that, uh, as Lucifer says, she's like the one in a billion unlucky person on the planet that was, you know, sort of destined to take hold of this. Now, Lucifer doesn't want it because he doesn't want to upset the balance. He has his domain. And that's the inference of this anyway. So he has his domain of hell. He doesn't want these other wars interrupting what he's got going on. You know, he likes to just focus on individual people, individual fates that he drags people down to. And and that's, he's happy with that. But one of the angels that fought with him in that first war in heaven, that when he was first sent down to earth and became, you know, Lucifer, um, Belial, Belial escapes hell and he's trying to find the lexicon so that he can then reclaim uh, control of this war. And so Lucifer's trying to inadvert- indirectly stop Belial uh, by trying to use the brother of Allison, the police officer, in order to find her. And then together they'll keep the book away from Belial. And this is all just to maintain the status quo. So Satan has hell. God has heaven, and all the other angels can just suck a dick, <laughs> apparently. Hey, Chris, how you doing, man? So, um, the premise I love, and there's a lot inside of this, which is great. If you've ever played the game in Nomine, which I've been like spewing all over this channel for months at this point, um, it's almost as if they watched all of my videos read all about the, the, the role-playing game in Nominate, and then they made this film, which they did not do. But everything in it is like talking as if it is the game, which just in, it inspires me to want to play the game, to do different types of stories in the game. It's very, very interesting. I mean, they even go so far as to call the, the angel bodies vessels, which is the vernacular in the game as well host or vessel, either or, it's interchangeable, depending on the type of angel or demon you are. But, like, the reality is, you know, there's, like, sort of rules about celestial um, uh, uh, forms versus the the vessels, and that's played off in this. There's a place that references the tether, so that that area where um, um, uh, Danny's and Allison's family were murdered, um, that place is now a tether. It's like it was ceded to Lucifer after all of the horrible atrocities happened. And so it's this almost like connection between hell and earth. And so when he gets his whole plan, Lucifer's whole plan is to use the detective to find the detective's sister and then get them both into this hotel so that Belial cannot take the book. Because as soon as it's in his tether in this building, then it's his rules. And Belial has to follow his rules. And Belial hops from vessel to vessel, very much like the video game in different, different. Um, well, they're called bands or choirs of angels and demons. Um, that, how they hop from body to body. So he starts in this woman who was like destroyed by dogs and then hops over to this other woman, then hops to a funeral director and then hops to a priest. And then he hops to Pinhead, Doug Bradley, not actual Pinhead, but, the, you know, Doug Bradley, the actor. And then um, from Doug Bradley, he's trying to hop into the police detective, Danny. 
And ultimately, Danny is going to, you know, at the very end, the last standoff, he's like, I'm going to shoot you. And then when that's going to force you to have to hop over to another body, I'm the only body that you can hop to, then I'm going to shoot myself. I'm going to redeem my horrible actions by saving my sister in the very place that I condemned both of us by turning in our parents. And this sort of beautiful poetic justice therein. And it's funny because just like moments, you know, like 10 minutes before, um, they were talk. Uh, he was talking with Lucifer, who's like following him around in the form of John Riger, and he's like, "Look, am I, I, I am I ever gonna be forced to like go to hell? Am I gonna ever see you again?" And Lucifer like sort of looks off for saying, "He's like, oh yeah, yeah, you, you, we're gonna see each other again very, very soon." You know, he's just like premonising. That's not even a word. He's, he has a premonition that he knows where John or Dan, Danny's gonna go because. He's Satan. He's Lucifer. He, he knows he's got his number, not just because he did a horrible thing, but he's going to commit suicide. And in Catholicism, that means you go to hell. And so he's just like, yeah, yeah, we're going to see each other again. <laughs> it's going to happen. And then cut to 10 minutes later, he's like, fuck it. I'm just going to off myself to stop this demon from getting there. Ultimately, when Belial jumps into his face and there's kind of cool little visual spectacle. It's like a bat crawling out of people's mouth mouth and back into it. But it's like this sort of like, uh, um, sort of ghost bat almost. Uh, and it's so fast and blurred that you can't really see how shitty the CGI is, it, but it's effective because it, it sells what it's trying to sell visually. I really dug it. And if the, if the story wasn't so convoluted when you're watching it, and you just listen to me explaining it, then it makes infinitely more sense. But the, sh the, the film doesn't do a very good job of explaining itself. You go through the whole first three quarters of the film trying to figure out what the fuck it's about, and then at the very beginning of the last third, uh, Lucifer, or the last fourth of the film, Lucifer does an information dump to Danny explaining everything. And so you're like, wait, wait, why does Belial want the book? But the why does he not want to be with you? Like, why is he rebelling against you, devil? Like, uh, that's not clear. And it's just the fact that Lucifer doesn't want to be involved in this other war in heaven. And so he's trying to stop his demons from being shit disturbers. Like, let the angels fuck around. Let them do their shit. We down here, we stay down here. <laughs> it's, just, it's weird, but I kind of dig it. And the fact that it has so much connection within Nominate the Role Playing Game, um, and maybe it's just because I've been like, you know, immersed in it for so long, that's all I see, which to be fair is probably what's the reality. I just love it. I think it's a, it's a fun little story. Now, the second half of it, which is the next film, uh, it's got some good actors in it as well, but um, I don't think it's. <laughs> If memory serves, it's a horrible film, even worse than this. So, I don't know. I mean, so The Prophecy Uprising, this, and The Prophecy Forsaken, which is the last prophecy film ever made, for good reason, um, they were filmed simultaneously in Bucharest, uh, Romania, which, which is where it's intentionally set. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, like, my favorite part has to be um, once the detective realizes what he does. There's this kind of cool little experience they get when they go into the tether, this, this massive mansion that's completely run down. Um, he, he walks into like this basement area and he starts getting like vision, phantom visions of the past and the atrocities that happened here, like all the torturing and murdering and stuff. And then you go to the, like the upper level and you see sort of the fall of everyone, all the communist party members that were murdering and torturing. They're being rebelled against by the local citizens and they sort of, they're overrun and stuff. I loved how they did the sort of flashback ghost sequences and how terrified Allison and Danny were when they first saw it because it fucked them up. And then of course, Danny saw himself selling his parents out and the repercussions of that just fucked him up all hardcore too. So I really, really enjoyed it. It, it felt like there was, you know, rebel angel, rebel demons. Um, there was that stereotypical heaven and hell. There was this intimate story of this family that is being sort of pulled into this grander infernal and divine war. 
And then you have the lexicon itself, which is actually the whole point of this this next film, which is just sort of a, a MacGuffin and suggestion in this film. You don't know why they're looking for it. You don't really understand it until the very, very end. And then you feel not really satisfied because it wasn't really the point. The point was the characters and their experiences. Um, and that was really cool. They did a lot of stuff where like ripping the heart out, you know, like we see in all the prophecy films, which is always nice. But the, the explanation for it is, is that if it doesn't have a heart, then you cannot possess that body as a vessel anymore. So it's a way of like, you know, finite, um, um, just, just like closing a door on a potential vessel for someone else, which I also kind of liked too. Um, Lucifer's character, Rygert, I thought he did a really good job. Um, again, you can't really compare him to Viggo Mortensen because no human should be compared to him. He is a fucking glorious actor whom I love, um, who no one can stand up to, like at all. And that's just reality. <laughs> what do you want, you know? Um, what else did I love about this? Like, um, I don't know. I just, I love the idea that angels and demons are dealing with reality, like our physical earthly reality in most cases we don't even we're not aware of it like in, you know, this is all fictionalized of course i'm not saying this is real um like we're not aware of it at all that it's happening but they're doing it and they have these massive infernal and divine schemes that sometimes interweave with our destinies or our fates and that's that in that moment of intervention is so incredibly ripe for storytelling that it's so fascinating. How could a, a human ever stand up to a divine being, a celestial? They couldn't. And so there's, the only thing they can do is try to fuck up their plans by surviving. <laughs> and that's like near impossible. So it's, it's almost like a survival horror show, except it's not filmed as well <laughs> as a survival horror show. I, I dug it. The downsides to this, my least favorite part, is that it's not good. <laughs> it's it's not filmed well. It's not acted well. Even Doug Bradley is just doing Doug Bradley. Um, they try to have funny moments, but it's just, it, it's never sold really well. And I think in the editing room, they made it worse. Uh, I mean, it's just, uh, it's not a great film <laughs> at all. So because of that, I ended up giving it two out of five evil eyes, and it probably should have only gotten one. But I do love the premise. I love this intimate storyline. Because it reminds me of the later Hellraiser films. After Hellraiser 3, all of the other Hellraiser films went to intimate stories about someone damning themselves in some way. Their behavior, or their actions, um, or the choices they make, or their desires... It all unfolds into damnation. And I love those intimate type stories where it's isolated, low budget. You're just telling a very small story and you're throwing in these cosmic elements like the Cenobites, demons from hell, hell priests, as Clive Barker likes to call them. That's that's money to me. Like, I love that. That's that's milk and honey. It's the greatest thing you could ever give me as, as someone who just loves horror is Intimate stories where you just have this backdrop of cosmic chaos, but everything is happening on this one-to-one -one human level. I love it. I love it so much. And the fact that we are almost always damning ourselves because of our own stupidity, which is real because humans are fucking dumb. So that's also part of why I give it an extra evil eye for, for what it is as a concept not for what it is as an executed film. And maybe that's unfair, but that's what I did. So deal with it. Have you guys seen any of these? You got to let me know if you enjoy these or if there's aspects you like or if they're just pure garbage and you never want to revisit them. Again, that's a fair reaction as well, but I am curious. All right, so in nominee has, has been so much fun so far and clearly you're awesome at it. Oh yeah, you are, 100%. Maybe not so good at being a valet. <laughs> All right, so that is my review of The Prophecy Uprising. I would recommend you watch it the first time if you like those types of stories. Sort of cosmic background, but an intimate human's tale. Then give it a go. You know, you may, you may resonate it if you like the, the sort of Abrahamic myth 
you know, of angels and demons and stuff. If you don't like that myth, then you're not going to like it, and there's no reason to, to watch it at all. But I'm going to close this out, not next week, but probably the week after or so, with the final film, Forsaken, and um, I will never watch these again. <laughs> I'll probably watch the first one, because I really like the first one. But the other ones are kind of... Um, n- there is no amount of naked dead bodies that could make me rewatch them <laughs> again all over. I just can't do it. All right, so always remember the evil spell backwards is live, everyone, so get out there and be evil. Thank <music> you.